The coast of Dorset has always been notorious for smuggling. But there was one smuggler who managed to avoid detection for six decades from the King's Men. His name was Isaac Gulliver. My name is Nigel Clough. As a historian, I'm going to be investigating how Gulliver developed a smuggling business worth millions of pounds in today's money. This is the story of Gulliver's smugglers. We know that Isaac Gulliver was born into a smuggling family in Semington, Wiltshire in 1745. He started smuggling goods across the Channel from France at a very young age and also married into a smuggler's family. In order to find out a bit more about his life, I've come to speak to Malcolm Angel, an expert on Isaac Gulliver. Well, Malcolm, you've brought us to Wimborne and to the great minster here, and uh, we're standing in the nave. Why are we at this spot? This is the spot, this is the spot where Mr. Gulliver is buried, um, between the two church warden seats. I mean, this is the most famous and prestigious church in the whole of the county. So here we have a notorious smuggler being buried by the church warden's chairs right here. I think it's marvellous. Um, evidence is that he always was a church man, uh, and, and why not? He also, of course, was a, a confidant of, of bankers in yeah. Wimborne and, uh, and ladies and gentlemen of, of great stature. Um, so I suppose he was accepted um, as, a, as a gentleman, mm. even though... Um, the revenue was certain mm. that he was a notorious smuggler. It's absolutely brilliant. We know, we know that Isaac Gulliver was a real person, mm. but how strong is the evidence for him actually being a smuggler? Uh, well, I guess the, the, the revenue describing him as, as Dorset's most notorious smuggler um, in writing uh, to the king is pretty good evidence. That is very good evidence. Uh, yeah. But in the, in the same sentence, virtually saying that uh, he was a man of great speculative genius as well. So by saying that the revenue not only knew him as a smuggler, but respected him as a man. When we first read about him in the uh, Salisbury uh, uh, and Winchester Journal, as being seen at the age of 14, smuggling on the North Shore of Paul, uh, and then being often seen drinking in the New Inn in Downton in Hampshire. So I guess we have some evidence there that as a young man, he was certainly following in his father's footsteps. I'm on my way to Mupe Bay exactly the kind of location that Gulliver and his smugglers may have used to hide cargo. It's in an ideal location with steep cliffs and it's surrounded by sharp rocks making it fairly hard to access. Somebody wanted to protect something in this cave and keep people out. They built this huge stone wall here with a big doorway uh, across there, you can see the aperture. There must have been big locks and hinges over there. So what was being protected in this cave? Was it Gulliver? Was there contraband inside? Although this cave is very inaccessible and quite hard to get to, once you're here, the conditions are quite dry and actually quite good for the storage of goods such as tea, tobacco and possibly wine. But once the contraband was on shore, how did the smugglers get it inland? through a smuggler's tunnel, perhaps? David Watkins of Poole Museum thinks otherwise. So you've been working in Poole for a long time as, a, as an archaeologist. Have you ever found any evidence of tunnels? No, none at all. And I've dug up an awful lot of Poole, and I've peered into an awful lot of holes dug by excavation machines, and I found the water table, but never a tunnel. So where, where do you think these, uh, these myths and stories about tunnels comes from? I think there's something that people want to believe in smugglers' tunnels, like they want to believe in pirates and that sort of thing. So how did they get their goods from the coast to the distribution point? Yeah, I think it's far more likely that they chose some little creek where they would have had a mule or a mule train, for instance, down there to collect the goods. And then they distributed the, go the goods just like anyone else was distributing them, really? Yes, I think so. Probably north to Wimborne and then all points of the compass from there. Do you think there was anything particularly significant about um, Isaac Gulliver as a smuggler? He was pretty large scale. I mean, he had a, had a considerable following. He had the reputation of n never actually killing anybody, which his henchmen were uh, probably still a pretty scary bunch. Do you think not having killed anyone was a sort of piece of uh, spin or propaganda? Or? It could well be that it kept him away from the hangman's noose. 
The Russell Coates Museum in Bournemouth is famed for its Victorian and Edwardian art. But today, Duncan Walker, the collections officer, has something rather different to show me. Yeah, reputedly, this is Isaac Gulliver's uh, pistol, which, as you can see, is quite a um, plain period uh, pocket pistol of the type. Um, obviously, it's a lead ball about the size of a marble. Um, if that hit you in a bone, say your arm or your leg, um, or basically you're looking at an amputation, it, it wouldn't just um, chip and ricochet off the bone. It would, you would have no bone. It would blow it completely out. It is conceivably the sort of weapon that Gulliver would have had. It is of the right period, um, but beyond that, I'm afraid um, we don't know. We don't know. Like I say, it's reputedly his. Five miles from the sea, St Andrew's Church at Kinson is associated with Gulliver. He was a church warden. The tomb outside the church was rumoured to contain a smuggler's tunnel, whilst tradition says that the church itself was used to store cargo. The strong tradition in this village is that Gulliver hid his contraband in the tower of this parish church, and that these quite extraordinary grooves in the tower were created by ropes to pull the contraband up by smugglers over many decades, if not generations. The tower would certainly be a splendid rendezvous, as it's been a strong landmark against the night sky for nearly a thousand years. The church tower here used to have six bells in it, but something very strange happened in 1797 when five of the bells were sold off. Why? Gulliver was the church warden here. Was it to make room for silk and wine? Towards the end of his life, Gulliver moved to Wimborne and appears to have led a more honest and respectable life. He died in 1822 at the age of 77. He was buried in the floor of the nave. By the 1990s, the tombstone was becoming worn by people walking on it, so it was removed for safekeeping and attached to the wall of the tower. It's very plain. For a man who left such a legacy upon Dorset, there's just the name Isaac Gulliver. No epitaph, no celebration. <laughs>